to being rubbish. Thank you. <laughs> Corrected him. Natsukato. <laughs> right, we're, here we go. OK, so I have way too many slides. So at one point, I'll just ask you to close your eyes so I can flip through them quicker than the time will allow. Um, what I would like to talk about is how to actually do capitalism in a smarter way, given that the title today is Smarter. And this actually requires rethinking fundamentally the deal, right? Everyone talks about things like the Green New Deal, but the deal bit is currently quite problematic. And how can we really get a new way for public actors, which are of all sorts of different types, private actors, small, medium, large companies, but also the financial sector, in civil society to fundamentally change the way that they interact in order to do capitalism better. So that's a sort of a big goal there. But this is the moment to talk about it, because this is an era which is quite different from previous eras, because you have hundreds of countries who have actually signed up to having some common goals around health, around climate, around inequality. And the question is, do we have the tools on the ground amongst these different actors to actually take this for real? instead of just talking, kind of walk the talk. And surprise, surprise, my answer is going to be no, we don't have those tools. And we really need smart solutions. But this can't be kind of just top down telling people what to do. We need to, again, rethink how currently we are operating, but also learn from some of the successes in the past, as opposed to the myths in the past in places like Silicon Valley. So anyway, it's not just the SDGs. It's also lots of organizations like the UN, uh, the OECD, I was there yesterday talking about uh, climate finance, uh, industrial strategies like in this country. Uh, you know, what does it mean to actually think, for example, of industrial strategy, not as a list of sectors, you know, or types of companies, startups, or life sciences sectors, but as a new way to actually approach the biggest problems of our time, whether they be getting the plastic out of the ocean or solving a huge problem in London today, which is knife crime amongst young teenagers and actually to say we're going to solve that problem by getting lots of different actors, public, private, third sector, and every single sector into that mix. And by the way, AI, big day at a digital, they are part of any of these missions that I'll be talking about later. We shouldn't have an AI strategy. We should be asking what is the contribution of AI to the biggest problems of our time. Anyway, um, and the problem is that we don't have very smart tools. I've said that, and I'll keep repeating that. We have pretty stupid tools. Um, in the public sector, because there's been this self-fulfilling prophecy that the more we think that the point of the public sector is literally just to wait for things to screw up, we call these market failures in economics, in order to step in, the more or the less we even have uh, kind of an incentive to invest in-house in public institutions in the kind of capabilities and capacities that are actually required to co-create value, to co-design a system, to, to shape, co-shape, co-create markets themselves. And we shouldn't forget that markets, the word the market, the market is not like a boogeyman out there putting market pressures on particular actors. Markets themselves are outcomes of how public, private, third sector institutions are governed and how they relate to one another. And I keep saying this word third sector and actually means nothing. It's basically everyone else who's not public and private. But there's very specific institutions I'm thinking of, like labor unions, which have been fundamental in the history of capitalism for getting us some of the best social innovations of our time, like the weekend, not bad, uh, <laughs> eight-hour workday, not bad. And you know, one of the kind of questions I often ask trade unions is, what's the equivalent of the weekend today that we could be fighting for that would really benefit everyone? even when you're not in a trade union. Anyway, and let me just say one more thing about trade unions, because you probably don't talk about them very much at Wired Events, do you? You should. Um, when you have a big transition, any sort of technological transition, like the green transition, today, for example, the labor unions are thinking about how to make sure it's just so that workers who get displaced when we go from brown industries to green industries aren't just kind of you know, lost in the process. And so there's this concept of the just transition. But if you come back to my earlier point that markets are all about how public, private, and other types of institutions come together, really the question is, where are the trade unions ex ante, not just ex post? So labor's voices, whether it be through unions or other mechanisms, through co-ops, through mutuals, and even defining the transition itself instead of just having to adapt to it afterwards. Anyway, just wanted to say that because I do think that uh, 
we should be talking about labor, not just in terms of it being displaced because of the robots, but really bringing those voices to the table um, before. Anyway, so unfortunately in economics, and we do have a lot of power, it would be nice if the poets had just as much power as economists, but economic policy has a lot of influence in how lots of things get done. This notion that you're just there to fix things, so invest in basic research because there's a problem called positive externalities, not enough research being invested in. Do a carbon tax because there's this bad thing that happens when you have negative externalities. Asymmetric information, invest in those cute little SMEs. It's not that these and that's basically the people in the audience, right? I shouldn't be dismissing it. No, I, it's not that I don't like SMEs, I just think we mythologize about them so that when, for example, the ones that actually want to innovate, the startups that want to innovate, the small and medium enterprises that want to invest and innovate, get the finance that's distributed to the whole mythological notion of small is beautiful, it's often not enough. But that's a separate point but it does get justified by this kind of static notion of asymmetric information. So it's not that these market failures don't exist, is that had policies in the past been driven simply by this kind of patching things up, they would have also not really justified, as I said, any investment in the bureaucratic machinery here on the right uh, to actually do things smartly, because you're just waiting for someone else to do things and then you clean up the mess later, but also it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. Where would you want to work? With these colorful teams there or this kind of black and white Kafka-esque kind of notion of the bureaucracy. And yet it's a myth, it's a complete myth. If we look at the history of the general purpose technologies, so those technologies that have actually influenced productivity changes across the whole economy, changes in production, distribution and consumption, these technologies have actually required lots of different types of public activity by specific types of agencies, well-designed and strategic, which often we don't have enough of because of the self-fulfilling prophecy, but we need to really learn from that story because otherwise, if we don't get how the GPTs came about, we surely are not gonna get the SDGs. That rhymes, so I like to say that. Um, and so what I've tried to do in my work is both through the entrepreneurial state notion, just kind of talk about that history, you know, what really happened in some of the few places and regions that have achieved this notion of innovation-led growth, Silicon Valley or other places, China today, um, and then what are the underlying kind of value principles, but also stories, problematic stories that have been told um, about that and why that then drives lots of really kind of not very smart policies and why it's also at the core, I would argue, of many uh, problematic policies that are driving inequality today. Anyway, and it's not that this is completely new. You have really smart people like Bill Gates admitting that both he and Steve Jobs surfed on this massive wave of public investments, but even how it's phrased here, it's just about the research, right? You know, okay, fund a lot of basic science and then we entrepreneurs can ride on that and do all these great things downstream. And the truth is actually that the whole innovation chain has often had, when it was successful, different types of public actors distributed throughout it that were strategic, that were mission-oriented, thinking big. The internet itself was a solution to try to get the satellites to communicate. GPS was a solution to another mission, knowing how to bomb the hell out of particular places in a very specific way. That's terrible, but that's the truth. Lots of military-funded inventions came from the fact that the military had a problem that needed to be solved and used procurement policy to drive through that bottom-up innovation to get there. So one of the obvious questions that I'll be coming to in my last minute of the talk is imagine doing that for social problems. Again, inequality, climate, health, et cetera. Anyway, throughout the whole chain, so basic research, applied research, early stage high risk funding, sorry, it ain't from VC. The really early stuff, stuff is either from you know, friends and family, but most people don't have rich friends and family, or through organizations like the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which in the US is, operates through procurement and really provides that super early stage, very high risk finance. In Israel, through Yasma, Public Venture Capital Fund. In Europe now, the EIF funds inside the European Investment Bank, they do come really early and do the more capital intensive, high risk, high uncertainty uh, investments with VC coming in later which is fine, we just don't tell that story. And even more downstream, procurement policies, very important. We wouldn't have had Moore's Law, basically, without massive amount of purchasing uh, from government. Anyway, and you know, this is the history of the iPhone. I'm not gonna talk about this because I've, I've kind of ranted about this enough, but anytime people say that, like, ah, oh, that's not true, I just say then throw out, throw, it, throw away any smart product you have because everything that makes it smart 
the Smarter Conference and Not Stupid was actually funded by a particular type of organization, including scary ones like the CIA who actually funded the uh, touchscreen display. But both that, Siri, again, GPS, internet, all the things that are smart inside these really well-designed products required particular types of organizations. It wasn't just public money thrown down from helicopters. Um, and today in the clean tech industry, green tech, we're seeing the same thing. If you're interested in this, just get onto the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Database. You'll just see it. All the funders in that upper right-hand quadrant, high uncertainty, high capital intensity, are coming from different types of public actors. There's lots of different finance inside clean tech, but those that are actually willing to make some of the bigger bets, again, both in terms of uncertainty and capital intensity, come from uh, 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 particular types of agencies that, again, we just don't talk about very much, whether it be ARPA-E, the sister organization of DARPA and the DOE, or different types of public banks. And what they're doing is they're funding the, the harder bit, right? So wind energy today is no longer that uncertain, so that's kind of obvious that you would have lots of private activity there. But laying the way and crowding in, that's the economic speak, crowding in different types of private actors is the role of the public sector. So that is still happening today around marine, which still hasn't um, gotten to the stage of solar and wind. Anyway, I think this is where I start having too many slides. So what's really important here is to understand that this is not about fixing markets. This is actually about having purpose, public purpose missions within the public sector. And if we don't do that, then it's just money. And money comes and goes. You know, even the whole austerity thing all of a sudden got reversed. But if in the meantime you've killed off really important institutions, they can actually take half a century to come back. And I'm thinking of institutions like PBS, by the way, in the US that has been under attack for some time. Again, ARPA-E, uh, the BBC here, GDS, lots of different public institutions. We need to better understand, just like we do with the private sector, how they can be designed to be more mission-oriented, strategic, catalytical, create additionality. Um, and this requires a new story, a new language. What is the orange bit? Is that when I'm supposed to stop? No, there's, there's a red bit at some point, good. Um, <laughs> so it just, you know, it's not about picking winners, it's about picking the willing. You know, who's actually willing? Which organizations in society are willing to engage with some public purpose type missions? Um, it's not about fixing markets, it's co-creating. It's not about de-risking, I hate that word, or this word facilitating. Facilitating, I'm Italian, facile means easy. Why should the public sector make things easier, right? We should think about what are the difficulties we have ahead and how could we approach them together and share both the risks and the rewards. Um, and so I've had the huge honor of being able to influence some policy around this area. So I was asked by Carlos Modas, who was the uh, EU competition commissioner, to kind of think through some of these ideas that I've been advocating for some time for EU innovation policy. So now there's this 100 billion euro horizon project, just forget about Brexit for one second, just pretend we're all in it together. Um, and a bit of it, which used to just be blah, blah about challenges, I helped them reformulate them in terms of mission. So the idea is you begin with a challenge, and again, we kind of have them, the SDGs, let's not rethink that, but you turn them into specific missions that you can actually answer, yes or no, did you achieve it? And the point is to really frame them as ambitiously and inspirationally as possible so they galvanize and catalyze lots of activity across different sectors. So going to the moon was not just aeronautics, it required innovation in nutrition, materials, textiles as well. The whole software industry basically came from that as a spillover, not bad. Um, and then to redesign government uh, procurement, grants, loans, it's a lot of money. You know, just the Ministry of Transport in this country has billions, I think it's 35 billion in a procurement budget, whereas the innovation budget is like 9 billion. So what does it mean to transform what government does day by day to actually drive through bottom-up experimentation, multiple solutions, of which many will fail? So we did this, um, you know, this would be an example, Plastic Free Ocean, lots of different types of projects. These are just some of the hundreds of different projects that might exist, but to fuel solutions to a public problem. And by public, I mean one that's also co-designed, bringing those different actors to the table, as I've been talking about. Um, again, I don't have time, but if you're interested, I even brought some copies, I think, of both this document, but also the harder one, which is how do you do this stuff? What does it mean, for example, even for how we evaluate public investments in the Treasury? away from cost-benefit analysis and net present value towards something that actually captures, encourages um, all those spillovers along the way that I mentioned have always been critical to innovation. Um, and in Europe, they've actually now come up with these five mission areas and they're gonna be thinking through the teams, the mission boards, specific uh, missions within that. 
uh, we've tried to help the, this was again before the current mess, but anyway, with the previous government, the industrial strategy, really helping Greg Clark make sure it was challenge oriented, and then we formed a commission, David Willits and I, to really help the government think through particular missions within each challenge, like the future of mobility one, and even just putting the word 100% accessible transport system and future mobility, all of a sudden, all the bottom-up innovations around disabilities. Isn't that great? Um, also in uh, Scotland, helping to set up a new public bank, and the first thing that we said was, be careful, don't just make it a handout machine to any business that asks for money, but use it to really provide that patient, long-term, committed, mission-oriented finance to those organizations that are willing to engage with, the Scot with uh, Scotland's big missions, for example, around digitization, um, possibilities around the NHS. Um, let me just move on and just say that none of this, well, this is the evaluation work we're doing with the Green Book and the Treasury, but what I did want to say is that to do this for real, I just want to come back to my first point about the deal. Again, that rhymes. Um, <laughs> this really does mean about sharing not only risks but also rewards. The state of California, you might have heard, just over the last month have been talking about a wealth fund. Why? With all this wealth and value that really has been collectively created, what does that mean for how we distribute it? Not in a redistribution only kind of way, as important as that is through taxation, but a pre-distribution kind of way that really reflects all those different types of actors in both the business community and the public sector. And whether this be also around stronger conditionalities, making sure that profits that are generated from that collective and social investment are also reinvested back in, as opposed to the $3 trillion of share buybacks we've seen in the last 10 years, or again through wealth funds, or really making sure we govern the innovation system in such a way that uh, produces a public return, so not allowing patents that are publicly given contracts uh, for, for 20 years, for, for 20 year monopolies, to make sure that patent system is really fueling innovation and not stifling it as it is today because it's abused. Anyway, lots of different thinking on that front, but that really requires rethinking value as collectively created and sharing both the risks and the rewards. And wouldn't it be great if Wired could be part of that conversation to make capitalism be not just smarter, but also more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you.